Well, good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I just wanted to a couple housekeeping things, and then we're going to turn over to Elizabeth and uh, Lynn. Good evening. Thank you all for coming through the road construction once again. We're getting close. We can tell we're getting really, really close to being done. And we're getting to get ready to end. But um, thanks for making that through, through the mess that they have, whatever we do with these stairs now. So, um, and one other thing if you have a book here and you purchase it before you get it signed, please, that's all we ask. Um, there's certain ones of Lynn's and Elizabeth's books that are all ready for sign off. So make sure you stock up. Christmas is coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, both online at your workhouse.com. Um, so, but I'm going to turn it over to Lynn and we're going to have a good evening. I agree. Thank you so much for coming. A lot of you have heard me here before, but I wanted to come and introduce you to one of my favorite authors, which is Elizabeth Musser. Uh, we met a long time ago because we shared the same publisher, Bethany House. And so we would meet at various events and we just became friends. And then in 2014, our German publisher, we shared the same German publisher, invited us over on a book tour. And I don't know everybody else in Germany, but we had a great time. <laughs> and we just got to really know each other really well. And a third author was with us, Tammy Alexander, Tamara Alexander. And again, I would highly recommend her books as well, historical fiction. Uh, so we became good friends. And then Elizabeth got this bright idea to start a prayer group. Somebody asked her, uh, another fellow author. And so there are six of us authors. I think a lot of you are familiar with Sharon Gardle Brown. She used to live in this area, and now she's living in Scotland. So we have a prayer group with um, Susan, Susan Meister, another author, great author. I Deb Rainey and Robin Grant. And we meet once a month through Zoom or Skype and we pray for each other. And it has been such a blessing to have authors that we can pray for each other, family needs. We've all gone through illnesses with parents and um, crises with our children, but also when it comes to publishing, to have somebody who understands and knows you can say oh you know what my editor said or you know whatever and you understand and talk with each other and be honest with each other and pray and i just think it's so special that we're not competitors but we're friends and prayer partners so i just love her books i'm always happy to endorse her she has a very unique story uh, personal story and um i think plays over into her writing and uh, so let me introduce Elizabeth and she's going to tell you all about herself. Bonjour, c'est un vrai plaisir d'être parmi vous ce soir. Hello. Hi y'all. <laughs> It's great to be here tonight. <laughs> so yes, I'm Elizabeth and um, thank you Lynn, my dear, wonderful author friend, and thank you to Chris and Becky and all the, the folks at Baker Bookhouse. It's great to be here. I've never been here, and what a beautiful bookstore. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. Um, I was raised, born and raised in Atlanta. That's Georgia, in case y'all don't know. And <laughs> then I attended, a, I attended college in Nashville, Tennessee, and I majored in French and English. And I graduated in 1982. And my husband and I just celebrated not 40 years of marriage, but 40 years um, of 40 years ago, we joined as singles um, our interdenominational mission board, which has changed things numerous times. It's called One Collective now, it was formerly International Teams. And we, Paul and I, have personally worked in three different cities in France. Um, and for most, for most of our years, we were just helping um, support and build up the evangelical church in France. 
But 12 years ago, our role changed and the president of our mission asked us to, um, to become what is called a pastor to missionaries. And basically that means we have the oversight for the spiritual well-being of one collective missionaries um, for us in Europe and in North Africa. But my husband, Paul, also manages a team of 10 other missionaries who do pastoral care for missionaries all over the, all over the world. And um, we have a great privilege of visiting and just meeting online with people who work with refugees, trafficked women, pilgrims, artists, students, um, impoverished uh, communities, uh, seekers. And our goal is simply to um, help our colleagues become or remain or get to a place of being healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically so that they can do their job well. Um, we have two sons, I call them our millennials. So Andrew is an engineer and um, lives in the Chattanooga area with his wife and college sweetheart, Lacey, and their five children, yes. So there's Jesse, who's 10, Naj, who's nine, Gwen, who's almost eight, Lena, who's two and a half, and Corey, who is eight months old. And our younger son, Chris, um, married his grad school sweethearts, Ashley, and they, last year, they live in um, Washington, D.C. But even before COVID, we were keeping up with our one collective colleagues through Skype, Zoom, WhatsApp, whatever. And our boss has said, as long as you have an airport and internet, um, you can live anywhere in the world. So to be nearer at, at the time, about five years ago, to be nearer our aging parents, our children and our grandchildren, we, um, we now split our time between France and the States. And we'll be stateside now. We just got here and we'll be stateside until late February. And we live about 30 minutes from Andrew's tribe in the booming metropolis of Flintstone, Georgia. <laughs> Yabba dabba doo. Um, we have yet to see Pebbles and Bam Bam, but I do dress up as Wilma for Halloween. <laughs> and so I, I want to share just a tiny bit about my writing career. So often people ask me how to become a writer. And ever since I was six years old, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. And that was a writer. And I am sure Lynn and probably Susie and Nero have feel the same way. I could not not write. It was just a part of who I was. It was how I expressed joy, sadness, my worries about boys, um, my questions about love and life. And my first poems were about animals. And I wrote them when I was six. I'm going to recite two of them for you tonight. So I have a little pony. I ride him all around. But when I take him over jumps, he throws me on the ground. <laughs> And then I, this is my second one. I have a cow. She moves and moves, but when she sees grass, she chews and chews. So there were lots of poems like that. And then I would write birthday poems for my family and friends. And I just always had stories running around in my head. And at nine years old, I, I started what I presumptuous, presumptuously called my first novel. And I wanted to be the youngest writer and not an and illustrator. I also illustrate that was. Um, I, I want to be the youngest ever, and that book remains unpublished to this day. But at school, I wrote stories, short stories for my junior high um, English classes, and I figured out how to fit, fit fiction into the events of the past for my American history teacher. And I devoured books. You know, as a young girl, I read um, Nancy Drew, and then I read and Walter Farley's Black Stallion, and then Mary Stewart's Beautiful heroines and her mystery romances. Um, but even though writing was super important to me, I had another passion, even more important and all encompassing, and that was to know God. And I attended a big church, loved Sunday school, where I memorized Bible verses and listened to Bible stories and learned to pray. And around the age of nine, I understood the, the basics of the Christian gospel, that God had created man in his own image and wanted to have a personal relationship with him. But um, I, even as a child, could never be good enough to merit God's favor. And so God did something extraordinary. Um, and it was the first Bible verse I memorized. And probably one of your first two, for God so loved the world, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so at the age of nine, um, with the innocence and sincerity of a child, I did what the verse says. I believed in Christ and no one pushed me to make that decision. Not my parents or my Sunday school teachers or anyone else. God drew me to himself and I loved him with my whole heart. And so I had this other passion in my life to love God and live my life for him. And for me, I was writing what I will call inspirational fiction long before there was any category at Barnes and Noble or anywhere else. Um, in my mind, I couldn't separate my faith from my writing. Um, what I believe just naturally found its way into my stories, even as a young girl. And I, I enjoyed communicating my faith through the written word. Now, this does not mean that I thought I was God's gift to literature. Au contraire. Um, but I recognized my gift. And with fear and trembling, I asked the Lord to bless it. Um, so my faith in Christ and my love for writing have been the two passions that have guided my life ever since I was a young girl. So fast forward now to my early years on the mission field. I was a young mom with a toddler and another baby on the way. And I asked the Lord to show me my, what my role was. Um, I, of course, helped with ministry. And um, I did some writing. I mean, I wrote stories. But and I, I really what I did is I turned the day's catastrophe with two little kids into an analogy that had some spiritual worth to it. Um, but... I also determined to make my quarterly prayer letters that I'd sent back to people in the States the best writing I could do. And lots of people would write me back and say, you have such a gift, you should write a book, which is what I wanted to do all my life. So they were used, those letters were used by the Lord to encourage me and keep my dream alive. And I always say, if you recognize a gift in someone, tell them. You might be the one the Lord's using to help spur that person on. Then during a summer uh, furlough in America, this is 1994, before internet, I, mean, I literally wrote hand letters to find out if there were any writing writer conferences. And so I attended my first writer's conference, and I met a book editor who had been a missionary in France with my mission, and I had met him before. And I had a 15-minute interview with dear Dave Horton. Do you all know Dave? Well, oh, wonderful Dave Horton. In which I said, um, well, I didn't know what to say. I was scared to death. I said, um, I want to write a woman's devotional. And Dave, ever the gentleman, said, oh, well, we don't need that. But we need a woman novelist. And I thought, when did you ever hear a publisher say, we need a woman novelist? And I thought, well, I can do that too. And I felt like the Lord had sent it put me in the right place at the right time. I, it had been, I had been praying about this for 20 years of just praying and writing. Lord, if you want me to do something more with this gift, show me. And four months later, I sent him a proposal. I learned how to do that. And then he presented my proposal to the committee two weeks after that, and I had my first contract. So it sounds like a dream come true, and it was, but it was preceded by lots of prayer and, um, and writing. And I was ecstatic. And I say every day that I sat down at my old IBM computer, I felt like I was getting a hug from the Lord. So that's a little glimpse into my, how my writing career began. And although I've lived in France for the past 35 years, I'm a Southern girl at heart. And most of my novels are set in the South, um, with Atlanta being my favorite setting. But in the novel, this novel, which you will see, uh, it's called the By Way of the Moonlight, um, I'm not just focusing on Atlanta or even Buckhead, which is the neighborhood where I grew up. Um, this time I focus on the house and property where I grew up in Atlanta. I weave a fictional tale around my parents' home on Nancy Creek Road as I ask questions about the words of land, family history, memories, and shared dreams. And with my lovely assistant, I prepared, um, I call it the Byway of the Moonlight virtual tour. And so Chris is going to show a few pictures or show the video. Yours, my novelist Elizabeth Musser, and I'm here to talk about my new novel, By Way of the Moonlight. I'm actually standing in the front yard of my childhood home in Atlanta, Georgia. We affectionately call this home Nancy Creek because it is on Nancy Creek Road. But the reason I'm standing here is because it is 
the inspiration for my new novel, and much of the action takes place in and around this house, which in the novel is called Hickory Hills, and you will find out later from other video videos why it's called Hickory Hills. But I just thought you would be interested in seeing this knob, this house. So my grandfather built it in 1938, and it's been added on throughout the years. And it looks like a one story, but it goes down a big hill. And in the back, it's a, it turns into a three story a barn in the backyard. Can't wait to tell you more. Stay tuned by way of the moonlight by Elizabeth Busser. In the novel, Allie, the present day protagonist, quotes the poem, the, Ro the Road Less Traveled by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood and sorry I could not travel both, but be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. And here are the two roads that diverge. This is behind the house. And if you take this road, you go up to the riding ring. And if you take this road, you go to the barn, which is there in the distance. By way of the moonlight, two roads diverged. Here's my inspiration for Hickory Hills, the name in the book of the stables and the property. This is the barn where I grew up feeding horses, showing horses, shoveling lots and lots of manure. <laughs> Up there is the riding ring. I'll be showing that to you in a few minutes with our one-eyed pony. And here is the house that inspired Hickory Hill and by way of the moonlight. As you can see, it's a three-story structure that's been added on to little by little throughout the years. And it, we say it's our family's little private rustic paradise. So thankful for what we call Nancy Creek and in the book, it's called Hickory Hills. This is the back of the property that in the novel is called Hickory Hills. And again, the roads diverged. I'm walking backwards up what we call in the novel, the second Rocky Road, the second driveway. Hi, so we've taken the road less traveled and we're up at going towards the right. So I'm going to open the cage and the paddle. Double side. And if you go straight ahead, we'll go to the right. But what I want you to show you right now is the barn. This is, you saw the front of the barn. This is the back of the barn. And if you look down to the edge of the barn, you'll see the one eyed pony fuzzy. I don't know if you can make it out. So the one eyed pony is what I'm saying. <laughs> So this again is the barn there. that inspired the barn in by way of the moonlight. I will say that that barn is a lot fancier than this one. But that one you wanted to say hi to you too, by way of the moonlight. So here we are at the riding ring. We walked up from the paddocks, we've taken the road less travel, walked up to the paddocks, and this is the riding ring. When I was a young um, tea and a, and a girl. We, I rode back here and there were more trees and lots of jumps. Now it's um, less used, but the size of the riding ring is the same as what I described by way of the, the moonlight. And this is, uh, as you can see, it's beautiful with the trees and you can also see deer back here. But in the novel, the first line of the novel says, Dinosaur bones found in Buckhead backyard. And this is the Buckhead backyard I'm talking about. That the, um, there's a backhoe that is digging up the ring and finds, quote unquote, dinosaur bones. It's not about dinosaur bones. I bet you can guess what it is. You'll have to read to make sure by way of the moonlight. Okay. In the novel, I talk about a crater. I think I call it a crater or a meteor i can't remember how to, i got my terminology wrong and my wonderful editor corrects me but anyway it's a big rock behind the right so here's and a lot of really important things happen 
um, on this rock. And this is my inspiration. And when I was a little girl, we would come back here with my brother. And even my younger brother, who's 14 years younger, he remembers this too. They would tell stories about giant balloon debob. Um, and I'm not telling those stories in the novel, but you have seen it. This rock, crater, meteor, or you come up with a name or find out when you read By Way of the Moonlight. We're right behind the writing room now. Another thing that is very important and symbolic are horseshoes. And here you can see the prints, the hoof prints of the horses. And if you look in the distance, I think you can see there is a stairway and it is used to help people get up on the horse. And, and it's used a lot at equine therapy, but in the book it's used for one of the main characters needs this. And someday you'll find out why this person, not telling you if it's a girl or a boy, needs a stairway like this to get on the horse by way of the moonlight. I've given you a little tour of the Hickory Hills outside. Now we're, I'm taking you inside, and in a moment I'll take you into the ribbon room. But first, I want to show you this plaque. A pony's work depends on how he's reared. I painted this when I was probably nine or ten, and I was just so pleased with my little pun. In the novel, um, the young protagonist, Dale, is inspired by uh, a plaque she finds that looks very similar to this. Uh, I thought you would be interested that to see that we novelists, we get inspired for our own novels by all kinds of different things. And I found this in my parents' house um, a few years ago while I was brainstorming By Way of the Moonlight. And there it is. Um, so By Way of the Moonlight, these are a few more of my novels. There's my mom with her champion thoroughbred when she was probably about 50 and my dad. They both have passed away. Beloved, and this story is an ode to them by way of the moonlight. Are in the ribbon room. As you can see, as I describe in the book, there are lots of ribbons. Maybe not quite as many as I describe in the book, but lots of paraphernalia from my mom and my own horse showing days. I'm going to take you over to this picture. Where this is my mom and her friend with their look-alike horses in the couples class. Because as you read by way of the moonlight, the couples class is very important. Um, here's mom on her champion horse, Bonnie Jean. Some other photos. That's me showing. But I wanted you to just get a look at the ribbon room and especially these old photos because I mentioned them in the book and the, the ribbons are super important too and of course the horseshoe hold a special place in the story in case you don't know the part the of the horse this is so I can't wait to introduce it to you <laughs> one more inspiration for the novel this charm bracelet my grandmother's charm bracelet which i found in um going through my mom's jewelry. And uh, as you can tell, there's the cameos. This one says Elizabeth. This one says Jerry, my older brother. This is Barbara, my mom. This is um, a charm for the 25th anniversary of my parent, my grandparents' wedding. And this one is, and it's important. It has, I don't know if you can tell, it's a calendar from November um, 30. Three and or maybe it's well, you can probably tell better than I can. There is a diamond in the last little um, square, which is normally would be the 30th of November. But all of these things are super important and by way of the moonlight again, inspiration from my own parents, grandparents, my life. We are now entering the dining room. And a lot of things happen in the dining room, but one of the most important is that Allie, my present day protag protagonist, finds this silver urn in the dining room. And 
I wanted you to look at these pictures. This is my mom and her friend HM with their horses. And they participated back in the day in couples classes where the horses should look alike and they walk, trotted, and cantered in stride. And these are some of the silver bread trays my mom won during her equestrian days and the silver urn. Um, so you'll have to read by way of the moonlight to find out all the goodies of the dining and the silver urn and what was in the silver urn. Now we're in a bedroom that inspired what I call the pink room in um, the story. And you can see here's a cedar chest. The cedar chest also inspired some very important scenes in the book. And there's an arc, an advanced reader copy of By Way of the Moonlight. See the Hilton Head Rear Range Lighthouse. That has a very important role in the book, as does the Homefront Museum, World War II Homefront Museum on St. Simon's Island. And this little hand towel. Life gets hard to stand. You'll find out more about all of these items in By Way of the Moonlight. So these are from just from the World War II Museum, though I highly recommend St. Simon's Island. The Nazi spies that were captured, the Liberty ships. Scary posters. <laughs> That's the camp. That's what the camp looked like in Mount Hilton at Island in the 1940s. The lighthouse. Bonjour. Oh, there you go. You don't want to see that again. <laughs> So now that you've seen my inspiration for By Way of the Moonlight, I wanted to share the true story of the house on Nancy Creek Road. I mentioned it's, our, it's a five acre property and it's been in the family since 1938 when my grandfather built the house and a two horse barn out in the boonies of Buckhead on a dirt road. And he built it for my mom, his only child, and for her because she loved horses and she, he wanted to indulge her love for riding and showing. And my mother, as I said, was a great equestrian, uh, showing and jumping until she was 70. And she passed away in 2016. Over the years, the house and barn have evolved and have evolved into this private paradise for our family. But estates like my parents are being bought up and sold to contractors who implode the house and create cluster mansions on the property. And that was my mother's worst nightmare. And the whole family agrees. Um, so I've wrestled in my mind for years with the question of how can we keep this property after my parents are gone? And then I spent the last few years writing a story about how it might be possible. If you're a fiction writer, you, you try to bring these things up. Um, and the very day I turned my manuscript for By Way of the Moonlight into my publisher, um, and much to all my family's shock, my father was diagnosed, my beloved father was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And he passed away in February of this past year. And suddenly truth became stranger than fiction. And that, and, and now my two brothers and I find ourselves um, asking that decades old question with much more urgency. How can we keep the house? And as I've been writing the novel, I learned more and more about the beautiful ministry of equine therapy. And um, I like the protagonist in the novel, Alley, began to dream. What if the property on Nancy Creek Road called Hickory Hills became a place for equine therapy? So right now my brothers and I are praying about this, discussing it, asking if there's any way to use this property in such a manner with the caveat that it has to be self-sustaining and that doesn't often happen with nonprofits. So if it happens, it will definitely be a God thing. And now Lynn is going to talk a little bit about her books, and I'll come back and tell you a teeny bit more of them. Elizabeth and I were talking a lot about writing and how we approach books and our 
our way of doing it is so similar to each other. Um, a lot of authors, well, we fall into two categories, the plotters and the answers. The plotters have to figure out the whole book ahead of time and they, they write out the whole plot so they know where the story is going. The pantsers, it stands for seat of the pants, and it means you make it up as you go along. And I think we both fall into the category of make it up as you go along, which can be terrifying when you're halfway there. And where, where am I going with this? So the last three books um, that I wrote were also had a World War II um, bent to them, like her book has a World War II um, storyline in it. And so I thought it might be interesting if I told you a little bit about my process using these books, and then Elizabeth's going to share her process too. Um, some of you, if you've been to my other talks when these books were launched, you might have heard this, so you, you can be excused if you want to take a little nap. <laughs> <laughs> but if I were you, um, it takes place in England during World War II, and the inspiration for it was um, I have a friend whose mother was a British war bride. And she always fascinated me. I go visit my friend, and she had this. She reminded me of the Queen, just a short, very elegant lady with this very nice British accent. And so that was the inspiration. And we agreed that inspiration can come from anywhere. We just get this wild idea or something we see, and you just kind of want to pursue it. The book doesn't always end up exactly like the inspiration, but there's something that triggers that imagination and gets. Gets you going. And so it was my friend's dear little British war bride mother. Um, so then the next step is to research. And this is a fun process. Some people say, oh, you do so much research, but truth is, the secret is I love it. So, you know, it's not hard at all. And it involves traveling places, going and seeing things, and, you know, learning things, going to museums. It also involves reading books and going on the internet. And the research starts giving me plot ideas. And so for this book, when I started doing the research about the war in England, World War II in England, I found out that women were drafted. If you were between a certain age, I think it was 18 to 40 or something like that, you got drafted if you were a woman. And so you had to serve. And there were various ways you could serve. You could be on the women's land team. I forget what it was called, the women's land army. And they had to go out and grow, grow all the food because so many of the British men were fighting that all the jobs, not just the Rosie the Riveter jobs like in America, but all the jobs had to be filled by women. And I found out that Queen Elizabeth, who has recently passed, um, worked in the, she took her place when she turned 18. She went and she served in the um, ambulance corps, like driving trucks, repairing the trucks. And um, I just thought that was amazing. So that's what I made these two main characters. I all, the other thing, interesting thing I found when I did my research was that before World War II, you had this class system. If you watch Downton Abbey, you know there's the elegant rich people upstairs who change their clothes for dinner. And there's all the people scurrying around in the basement making life happen. But what I found out was because of this draft, because all the women had to have some sort of part, that was really the end of that whole hierarchy because you've got the queen, the princess, side by side with working women, you know, maids that might have worked in Buckingham Palace. And so that intrigued me. And so what the book developed into was a story of friendship. And that's the third stage. It starts with the idea then there's the research and it begins to flesh out. And then you sit down and start writing and you never really know how it's gonna end up. It's like, <coughs> I use the analogy of watching film develop, but nobody knows what that is if you're got, you know, camera now. <laughs> but in the old days, you had Polaroid picture, you take the Polaroid, you watch it, and you, see, you know, it starts going in and developing. Um, so what it ended up being was a story of friendship and also of faith being tested in the um, <coughs> in the end. So that was that book. Then my second uh, World War II book is Chasing Shadows, and this one takes place in the Netherlands during World War II. My inspiration for this one was Corey Tenbo. I read her book, uh, The Hiding Place, when I was a young wife, and it made such an impact on my life, and I thought, she was such a woman of faith, her and her sisters, her whole family. And I 
couldn't imagine um, going through what they did to me yesterday. <laughs> and how, how they could have their faith. But I knew when I read her story, I wanted that kind of faith. I wanted to be like her. So I decided to um, look into the World War II in the Netherlands. And when, in the research process, what I found out and I hadn't ever realized was Netherlands was neutral. They had been neutral in World War I. They had every intention of being neutral in World War II and not be caught up in it. But of course, the Nazis invaded them. And what a shock that was to the people. You know, they're just minding their own business, trying to stay out of it, and they could invade it. And when I did the research in the Netherlands and I went to, they had a museum of the war. What, I, what they really portrayed very well was that the people had three choices. They'd been invaded. One choice was you could collaborate with the enemy. And the Nazis thought that the Dutch were their Aryan brothers. They weren't prejudiced against them the way they were against the Polish or the Jews. They considered the Dutch their Aryan brothers. And they said, join the Reich. Everything will be great. You can govern yourself. Everything's fine. So that was one choice, was to collaborate. The second choice was to just put your head in the sand, lay low, do what you're told. You didn't have to uh, like what they were doing, but you just try to survive, you and your family. Just get by the, the best you can. And the third choice, of course, was you could actively resist. And I was amazed during the research that one of the impetuses for resistance was their Christian faith. A lot of times we think of the Netherlands as being a secular country, but World War II, they were a people of faith. And they said, we can't bow down to Hitler as our God, and we can't look the other way when the Jews are being persecuted. And so they resisted. And so the story that developed was one of, what do you do? when you're in this impossible situation and your faith and what God is telling you is one thing, but you're putting your family at risk. You know, if, if you're gonna hide Jews in your farmhouse, what about your kids? You know, what about your wife? Um, these are hard, hard questions. So um, this all developed out of that story. Um, the third book, Long Way Home, after writing two World War II books, I was getting to know the war pretty well. And, uh, um, but what I never saw was the aftermath. And I kept thinking when I was writing the first two, I kept thinking about my dad, who at the age of 18 enlisted and went off to fight in the Pacific War. He ended up in the Navy in the Pacific, and he was a signal man. He did the SOS, and was, I don't know what all of it, but he was a signal operator. And no context at all. He grew up in the city. He was an only child, um, parents of faith, church. And now here you are in this war zone. And I thought, how did you make that transition? And then how did you come back? As a young man, married, you have kids. How do you just put all that behind you and forget about it? So he was my inspiration. I started doing the research and found out that things like PTSD weren't recognized back then. There was no PTSD till after the um, Vietnam War. And so they were just expected to come home and make the best of it. And how, how do you do that? And then I saw a, a training video put out by the US government at that time, talking about the different treatments for what they called battle fatigue. And they didn't have the psychological understanding. They didn't have the, the medications for the anxiety and everything. And they just, all they had was Freudian. And so if guys got battle fatigue because he's witnessed horrendous things and can't forget, well, it must've been something your mother did when you were little. And so they're just helpless to, you know, try to combat this. So that all got swirled together into, you know, what do you do with a returning soldier who has PTSD and it's not recognized? The other half of this story, that's part of the story, is two, two, two things story. The other one was a little bit of information I found when I was doing my research, and that was about this ship called the SS St. Louis. Um, in, in Germany in 1939, early 1939, before the war started, Hitler was glad to get rid of as many Jews as he could. And so he said, fine, you know, you can leave. 
So there was a ship bound from Hamburg, Germany to Cuba. And most of the 900 passengers, nearly all of them were Jewish. And they had gotten landing permits for Cuba. And they thought we're free, we're done with Hitler, um, we're out of here. And so this whole ship went to Cuba, they got there, they landed in the harbor, the Cuban government wouldn't let them land. It was some sort of political thing where there was like a coup and one guy was out and the guy that broke the landing permits and the Cuban government said, you can't land. And so they're in the harbor and they're petitioning people all over the world. They asked the United States, can you let us land there? We don't want to go back to Germany, to Hitler, that he was persecuting Jews. They, they petitioned Canada, can we please come to Canada? And everyone turned him away. And I thought, you know, it brings the present day refugee crisis kind of into focus that there are people with real needs and, you know, we're just going about our lives and, you know, what's going to happen to them. And so I, I found this little bit of information when I was researching these books and I wanted to flush it out. I thought, what did happen to these 900 people? And I guess I'll just have to say you have to read the book. <laughs> I made a fictional uh, character on board the ship and, and what happened to all these passengers, maybe I'll tell you, but they, there were various European countries that agreed to take a certain amount of England took some, Belgium took some, Netherlands took some, but they were not happy about it. But most of the countries, except for England, they all ended up being invaded by the Nazis. And so all they sailed halfway around the world and ended up right back where they were. I would get there again. Um, so in, in the process of writing the book, all what developed, what I saw developing were all these questions about the Holocaust, about where is God when you pray and you believe and you ask and nothing happens. And, you know, these are hard questions, but I think we have to face them because none of us are facing the Holocaust, but we do face times when we pray and we ask God and doesn't answer the way we want. And, you know, you begin, your faith is tested. So when I'm writing, I don't think of the theme in the end. It sort of develops as I write, as I make up the story, as I go along. But what I do try to do with every book is I try to think of what it is that I like in a book. And first and foremost, I want to tell a good story because I like a good story. I like to get caught up in what's gonna happen and who's doing what. I like a book that takes me places that I may not ever get to go. I like a book where I can learn things, and learn new things. Like when I was reading her book about the horses, like she takes you into that whole world of the horse shows and all of that stuff. And that's fun for me. I'll never get on a horse, <laughs> go over a jump or show a horse and everything. And I love to be taken into a, something new, and uh, I really enjoy that. I also like a book that makes me laugh a little bit or smile at least at some point, and it makes me cry. I like to cry. Don't you love a good two <laughs> <in> next book? <laughs> That's really good. I confess I cry when I'm writing too. So when I set out to, tell, to write a book, I'm very conscious of the readers. That's why I like to come to events like this and see my actual real readers, because it reminds me that you're out there that you're waiting for the next book. And if you're gonna pay $14 or bargain table $6 for a book, you want a good story. You want your money's worth, but you also want your time's worth because you could be watching TV or God knows whatever else you might what you want to do, but you're investing time in my book and I, I really want it to be a good story. The other thing I really want in the book is a deeper meaning. Something um, engage my emotions, I want to see myself in the characters or in the situation. And so to invest in that emotionally as a writer, we have to ask ourselves, what are we learning? Like, are we this journey of discipleship? Are we learning to be better Christ followers? Are we learning to be better disciples? Um, and then that all goes in the book. But if, if I'm not growing, then I don't have anything to offer in the book. And the third thing I try to put in my book is a reminder of who God is and what he's like, that um, he's loving, he's all powerful, he has everything under control, 
Not that I want to preach a sermon, but through the course of the story to be able to see God has this. He's under, it's under control, that God is loving, that we may not understand what he's doing at the time, but there is a reason and there is a purpose. And the more I can remind readers of who God is, um, I think the better, the happier I am with that book. But in order to do that, we have to have our own, as writers, our own spiritual walk, which means our own discipleship journey, our own faith walk, um, prayer walk, whatever that is. Which brings me back to Elizabeth and the prayer, um, the prayer group that we're that we're part of, that we're all supporting each other in this journey and in our walk, so that we can be better writers, so that we can put that in our books for all of you. I think Elizabeth's going to talk a little bit about her inspiration. So I just say amen to everything that Linda said. I'm very similar way of writing. And I I it's I agree that just what inspires us, this latest book was my family home. But um the themes, we were talking about this earlier today, the themes in the novel, um, and I, I also I say I, I sometimes like to plug to my readers. I want to deal with things that God's dealing with in my life. And um but they come, I, I, my English teacher in high school, he read my first books and he said, yeah, you're a little heavy handed this year. You know, he said, you want your themes? They just come on me. Your symbols come on me. They just, they just come. And so that's what um, I think we both try to do. We, we don't set out saying, I'm going to teach about this. It's just the story. And so in this story, um, one of the main themes is about obsession. And um, just, you know, not that I've ever been obsessed about anything. So don't, don't think it's anything about me, but um, I, wanna, I wanted to examine the thin line between fighting for what we believe in and developing an unhealthy obsession. And um, both, so my, my story is in dual time. So that the present it's Allie trying to save the house and turn this place into an equine therapy center. And in the past, it's her grandmother, Dale, who um, is determined to um, find, to be with the love of her life, Tommy, this young equestrian star, and find her pony, her horse who's been sold because of the Great Depression. Um, and I, um, at the end of the story, I would say, um, well, I, I want to go back to just the inspiration very quickly. I, I didn't know, it, you know, I was writing, I had this idea and something got World War II, but then I just serendipitously came upon a photo of a group of military men. And I have the picture back on the, um, the table there of galloping their horses on this beach. And it was Hilton Head Island where we've vacationed for 50 years. But this was when there was, it was a deserted island. And then I found out about this Coast Guard mounted patrol and that horses were patrolling the beaches between 1942 and 44 because of all the German U-boats. And that a U-boat had sunk four times more tankers than could get to Europe with supplies. So you, you just keep falling down these um, rabbit holes and find these fascinating things. And um, I really, Loved doing the research, like and uh, like then said about World War II, and researching my old my own home. But um, I also found it to be super inspiring. I didn't know that much about the Battle of the Atlantic, and to understand about the heroism of many stateside civilians just doing their part to construct liberty ships or guard the coast from the German threat, um, and these men and women who were riding, they, for some reason, they couldn't serve overseas. So they might've been handicapped or they might've been the farmers and they had to stay. And, but um, they're from 17 to 70 years old. And, um, and some of them had never ridden a half horse in their life and some of them were champions. And <laughs> how it all came together, I found that so um, fascinating. And the, not my, my next novel that'll be coming out later, I mean, next year, it, I, I, I want to tell you the inspiration for it, and that I'll end with that. Um, 
but my brother is a genealogist. I mean, he's it's his hobby, but he is really a genealogist. And probably 10 years ago, he was on a site on the internet and a woman wrote him and said, um, I'm looking for a family line um, at three last names. And my brother got the note and he said, oh, well, that's our family line. I, I have information, are we related? And she wrote back and said, we're not related, but my great, great, great grandmother was a slave on your great, great, great grandfather's plantation. And I thought, well, there's a story. And just, and it happened, you know? And so in the, the, the new story and wonderful Teresa has already read that this novel has not been accepted by any of my publishers. It granted, you know, there's a few little delicate things that we're dealing with. But it's in it's in Dutch and Teresa's written in Dutch. But um, I take the a character that that these two characters meet in the present day, and then I go back to the great 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 grandmother who was on the plantation, and then as a free woman at during Reconstruction in Georgia, and I tie that into present day sex trafficking in Atlanta. So you know, light light beams, you know, <laughs> love. Um, but that's what inspired, you know, I'm inspired and I, and I've learned so much. And again, like Lynn said, our, what God is teaching us, I feel like I want to impart that to my readers, but in a good story, hopefully it's a good story. So, um, we are, if I, we don't have a lot of time, but if we, I, I don't know, can, do we have time for a few questions? Um, Chris or. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up on Hickory Hill too. You did in what state or I country? Okay. Wow. Well, good. No horses. No horses. Okay. <laughs> so, if you were to go to your family, um, or whatever you want to call it, state, whatever you want to call it, um, and pick up the the corral. Would be yes, so so I don't exactly say that in my author's note at the end because it is very illegal <laughs> inside the city of Atlanta. But there are five horses buried there, and the and there's cats and dogs. I mean everything. And my the latest horse was my mother's beloved mare. Um, you know you have to put horses down. It's just they're part of our family. It's just awful. So my mom, she. Um, they buried the mare in the middle of the ring, and there's a mound. You know, the other ones are a little more discreet, but this is a mound with a black. And she, so my husband is a pastor. She asked, she wanted to have a funeral. <laughs> and so she asked Paul, my wonderful husband, about if he would perform the funeral. And let's just say his family had animals, but they didn't weren't part of the family so he was a little freaked out and he said my younger brother is also uh, a minister and so he said Glenn you grew up with horses you can do it so my <laughs> younger brother there were like 50 of us standing in the ring and we had a funeral or a memorial for Greta Greta's in the book I, you know I use all the names of our horses in the book so yeah so there are and but I always thought you know in 200 years of the Lord tarries and they dig, dig up the Thing. they might think it's a dinosaur bone, you know, and and so yeah, that was yeah, that was an inspiration from way back. Don't tell me. <laughs> yeah. Why is it in Dutch? Oh, so um, we, you know, our novels are published in several languages, and um, Holland and well, the Netherlands and Germany both they are. So I lived in France for 20, 35 years. You know, one of my novels is in French. I paid for the translation. There are Christian bookstores, but in the mind, yeah, in the mind of the French who read lots of novels, but they're not gonna go to a Christian bookstore and buy a novel. They'll buy a Bible or a book on theology or a biography. But in Holland and in Germany, they have very active, um, great, Stores and we toured. I mean, they it, yeah, just lovely. Um, so yeah, it's in Dutch and German, Norwegian, and, and some people sometimes say, I can't. Well, Teresa today she said, um, Oh, I've read that. She reminded me because she had written me, she, I've read your book in Dutch. 
can't wait till it comes out in English. I'm like, well, maybe you don't know. But yeah, so different languages. I've had people ask me, I know you know all those languages, like you know German. <laughs> No, <laughs> we write it in English, yeah. Well, thank you.